we now move on to discussing another important element in a power system. Our lectures so far have been concentrated on uh, modeling a synchronous machine, which itself uh, was a fairly long and tedious process. In the last class, we described some simplified models of a synchronous machine. Of course, uh, the, there is practically no end to the amount of detail one can go in uh, our discussion of synchronous machine modeling. There are in fact, a few topics, which we have not uh, covered. One of them being the saturation performance of a synchronous machine. How would you change the modeling in case saturation exists? Uh, we will not uh, uh, discuss this much in detail in this course. In fact, we will just carry on. Uh, I can uh, uh, refer you to the books, which, uh, which I had mentioned right at the beginning of the course. Uh, you can refer to them and there are some interesting references relating to saturation modeling. Now, remember what is the main issue there? When you try to model a synchronous machine uh, with saturation considered, remember it is no longer what is known as a linear machine. Okay. Uh, in that sense, you cannot uh, you know get a flux current relationship uh, which is linear and as a result of which it becomes difficult to apply the full machinery of d q transformation. Remember that when we did the modeling of a machine, when we derived the inductances mat uh, inductance matrices, which relate the fluxes uh, in the A winding and the currents in the A, B, C, D winding and so A, A, B, C, F, G, H, K windings. Uh, you will notice that what we did was of course, uh, you know try to do some kind of superposition of fluxes, MMFs, etcetera. You know we effectively used superposition uh, in order to determine uh, the nature of the inductance matrices. You can no longer do so in case saturation exists and that really queers the pitch and uh, as a result of which uh, there, there is not a nice or a neat or a mathematically rigorous way to approach uh, you know uh, saturation in a synchronous machine. Of course, one may argue that again you know uh, whenever you are modeling there is uh, the physical laws are known and one should be able to model even saturation. Uh, by actually computing the electromagnetic fields and the you know uh, the flux configurations which exist during saturation of a synchronous machine, but uh, that would be really very tough and it's not justified uh, when doing uh, stability kind of studies when we are studying slow electromechanical transients. But under certain circumstances, it can actually affect the result. For example, the even the steady state behavior of a machine, if one doesn't consider saturation, one can end up with uh, you know a fair degree of error and uh, that is the reason why people are worried about it. The and uh, although a very rigorous way of tackling saturation has not really been discussed in the literature, but uh, uh, some ad hoc techniques have been discussed and I refer you to uh, the books by uh, uh, Padiyar, Kundur and uh, good discussion exists also in Sauer and Pi. Uh, which discusses some of the theoretical implications uh, of uh, various saturation models. So, I uh, the basic model which we have derived uh, in the d q reference frame, we tweak it a bit, we tweak it, we do not really go ahead and try to um, st start from scratch and try to derive a saturation model, uh, which is absolutely rigorous, but we just simply tweak the d q model. Uh, to account for saturation and it is quite ad hoc and uh, you can say a pragmatic approach is usually followed. Uh, we do not discuss this any further, um, I refer you to the books uh, which I have just mentioned. We move on to uh, today's lecture which is on excitation systems. Now, uh, to look at the role of excitation systems, uh, let us just look, look back what, uh, at what we have been doing. We have studied a synchronous machine uh, connected to a voltage source or an infinite bus. Sooner or later, we will have to consider synchronous machines connected to other synchronous machines, to loads, to a network okay, uh, and uh, try to uh, infer, you know, infer how a power system behaves, an integrated power system behaves. Okay. But even before we interconnect a synchronous machine to a network and try to study that kind of system, uh, we can 
look at the two important inputs which are there in a synchronous machine. Uh, that is one of them is of course, the mechanical power or the mechanical torque and the second thing is the field voltage. We have been using the symbols T m and E f d uh, in our synchronous machine model. In fact, all the simulations so far we uh, took E f d to be some kind of constant. In fact, we did simulate step changes in uh, the field voltage or E f d, but uh, we did not really have any kind of continuous control over uh, either the mechanical power or the field voltage, but these two are essentially the inputs uh, to our synchronous machine. Now, if you look at uh, where uh, we are right now, we have done the synchronous generator modeling in which we have the rotor mechanical equations and you also have the machine flux equations, they are differential equations uh, in um, the fluxes of the machine and the rotor mechanical equations are generally formulated in terms of delta and omega and given the mechanical uh, the rotor angle the mechanical speed and the fluxes one interacts with the network you can connect a generator to a network which may consist of a voltage source it may be just a load or it may be other elements okay so you have typically a generator connected to a network and connected to other elements which could be other synchronous generators it could be other loads and so on okay now the generator itself has two inputs okay you have got your mechanical power or the mechanical torque and you have got the field voltage these two things are in fact things which need to be controlled okay now if you look at uh, another figure the power apparatus which controls the mechanical power is essentially the turbine and a boiler. Boiler of course, in case of a steam turbine driven machine. So, you have got a boiler and a turbine in a steam turbine driven machine, which really gets the mechanical power at the shaft of uh, at the shaft of a generator. Okay. The power apparatus which generates the field voltage for a synchronous machine is called as an exciter. and uh, it is uh, usually consisting of at least one controlled power electronic equipment. So, in fact, you will find that uh, the exciter is a controlled element by which you can control the field voltage okay? and it, uh, the control is via power electronic converters. Okay? Now, the valve or the gate control of a synchronous machine really controls the mechanical power input to the machine. Okay? So, you can control uh, both the mechanical power and the uh, excitation to a synchronous machine. Now, there are various ways you can uh, generate this field voltage. We will consider two of the most common ways one can generate field voltage uh, for a synchronous machine. Okay? So, we have to actually when we talk about excitation systems, one, one of the things we have to discuss is the power apparatus that is the excitation system and of course, the control of the field voltage itself. Okay? Uh, we kind of hinted when we considered uh, the simulations in the past two lectures that if we we need to change the field voltage, okay, we need to change the field voltage as the generator is loaded. Otherwise, we may not be able to operate the generator acceptably. acceptably. In the, the case which we simulated, we saw that trying to load a synchronous machine without a simultaneous control of the field voltage resulted in a loss of synchronism when the machine was loaded up to its rated value. So, we do require some kind of a control over the field voltage that is a very important idea. Okay? Now, the various ways of course, one can uh, obtain the power apparatus or the, the configuration of the power apparatus in order to excite a synchronous machine. Okay? Now, the major uh, controllable element in any of these excitation systems is as I mentioned sometime a power electronic converter. In fact, it is usually okay, a thyristor based controlled rectifier. So, most of the generators you will find have got a controllable element in the excitation system which is the controlled thyristor bridge. Okay? So, that is what is essentially there in a synchronous machine. Okay? Now, one of the important things you should uh, 
remember at this point is that a synchronous machine has got an extremely large synchronous reactance. What do I mean by large? Okay. In relative terms, if one wants to understand this, if you have a synchronous machine, okay. suppose you have got a synchronous machine which is unloaded, it is operating at no load. Okay. So, the field voltage which you would uh, you require a certain field voltage in order to get rated the rated voltage at the generator terminal. So, you will have to actually give a field voltage this is just represented uh, temporarily as a battery. The field excitation you would have to give so that you got the rated voltage. Now, the important point here is if I start loading a synchronous machine, if I start loading a synchronous machine you will find that. So, I load the synchronous machine, you load it and you will find that the voltage keeps on dropping and this drop can be very, very, very significant in the sense that if you take a typical synchronous machine, you will find that you will not even be able to load it to its full value, full rated value okay, unless you increase the field voltage. Okay. For example, a synchronous machine say with an x d of 2 per unit and let us say it is a x d and x q are equal, then the per unit power okay, per unit power will be equal to if you are e f you have got e f d into the voltage at the load divided by x d into sin delta. Okay. So, if I connect a synchronous machine to a voltage source whose line to line RMS is V, okay, then the per unit power is this. Now, if I keep my E f d at 1 per unit, okay, V is also 1 per unit, then the amount of power you can actually push is is half maximum power you can push is half per unit. Okay. So, if you have got a synchronous machine a synchronous machine connected to another voltage source, okay, then in that case the amount of power you can transfer is limited unless unless you change E f d. So, this is what is done when you load a synchronous machine from no load to full load you would need to change this E f d okay? and very, very significantly. In fact, uh, you may have to even double the amount of field voltage in order to load whenever you load a machine from no load to full load conditions. In fact, if you look at a typical generator which is used uh, in the Indian systems is a 247 MVA generator. Okay? This is a typical uh, unit sizing which is uh, found in uh, most in Indian power systems, you will find that the no load voltage uh, field voltage, this is the voltage applied at the field at no load is 102 volts roughly and uh, current under open circuit conditions is this, the field current. Okay? So, this is under open circuit conditions, this gives you 1 per unit at terminals. However, if you load this machine to its full rating, you will have to apply which is a value which is more than double the field voltage, so that you will get 1 per u at, at the terminals again. Okay? So, you see that you need to really change the field very substantially. The reason of course, is that the x d of a synchronous machine is very, very large okay? or in other words the armature reaction is very large. Okay? If you just connect a synchronous machine, you connect a synchronous machine to a resistive load, okay? this is just a schematic representation of that and you go on increasing the load by decreasing the resistance, you will find that the amount of power you can actually deliver has a maximum and that maximum is a very low value. In fact, the equivalent of a synchronous machine, electrical equivalent of synchronous machine in steady state, if it does not have any saliency, is simply a voltage source of magnitude E f d x d 
and the resistance R. And you know that if x d is large, the maximum power transfer is going to be limited. You are not going to, rather I should say the power transfer in this situation is limited unless I change E f d. Okay. So, I hope I made a good case that you really need to have a system in which uh, typically for large generators you need to have an excitation system which is very well controlled and has got a very large range as well. Okay. So, from no load to full load you really need to change the field substantially. Okay. So, uh, one example of a exciter the power apparatus if you look at is uh, the static excitation system and uh, what you really have here is the voltage which appears at the terminal of the main generator that is our uh, generator which we ha which we are studying in fact is rectified after stepping it down by a controlled thyristor based rectifier okay and then the dc value is fed to the field of the generator remember of course this is a control rectifier so i can control the dc value okay the dc value of it is fed back into the generator and this is one way you can excite a generator in fact it may uh, somewhat uh, you know worry you worry you initially because the the voltage which is required to be rectified in order to feed a dc voltage to the field winding is in fact being obtained from the terminals of the main generator itself and of course if the main generator is is on under open circuit conditions one may argue that there is no voltage at the terminals of a synchronous machine if no field voltage is provided so as a result you will get no ac voltage at the terminals of a control rectifier and the dc voltage is also not going to uh, will not really have any value it will be zero okay so this whole system may not work okay but uh, actually if you look at it it's of some kind of positive feedback system if there is some residual magnetism available in the generator it can generate a small ac voltage if that ac voltage is enough to forward bias the devices used in the control rectifier usually thyristors then that would cause a small dc voltage the dc voltage would uh, cause some field current which will enhance the existing if it enhances the existing residual voltage residual flux which is there in the machine you will find that the voltage increases and some kind of a you know positive feedback mechanism will ensure that the machine self excites okay so this actually can happen uh, in a practical situation of course because uh, you know you require adequate residual fluxes to generate initially an AC voltage will forward by the thyristors. We do not actually connect the synchronous machine from scratch in this fashion. Okay. What we usually do is start it up with a battery. Okay. So, your field voltage field is initially fed via a battery and then after that this particular configuration uh, the system switches over to this configuration in which the voltage generated at the terminals of a generator itself is used to power the field okay, in this fashion. Now, this uh, in fact can be actually shown uh, uh, in a laboratory using simple diode rectifier. So, if you actually uh, replace the control rectifier by a diode rectifier and just uh, you know feed the output of a generator back onto its field winding through a diode rectifier you find that the voltage builds up uh, on its own you know. So, it is a it's kind of spontaneous increase. In fact, it is an interesting exercise for you to show that in fact uh, this if you write down the differential equations or uh, the dynamical equations corresponding to this scenario you should be able to show that uh, in fact this is a unstable system and therefore it self excites. So, if you give any non-zero initial condition it builds up the voltage builds up on its own. Okay. One small caution again in a real system the residual voltages may not be residual fluxes in the synchronous machine may not be adequate to generate just that initial kick uh, to start uh, this self excited system and as a result of which you may actually have you may actually have to use the batteries in a power station to initially excite the machine and then switch over to this configuration. Okay. So, what I will do now is just show you a small video clip 
of uh, how one can simply excite a synchronous machine uh, uh, by simply connecting its output back onto the field via a diode rectifier. A diode rectifier in fact is not a controlled rectifier. So, we will not be able to achieve much control over the voltage which we are getting. I will just show you that the voltage suddenly kicks and the machine self, uh, self excites. Okay. So, what I will do is connect the diode rectifier or the input uh, of the diode rectifier to the output the terminals of a synchronous machine in the laboratory. Then the DC terminals of the rectifier I will feed it back to the field uh, field of a synchronous machine. Then I will rot start rotating the machine slowly and at a particular point you will find that this whole system excites on its own. Okay. So, let us see that video clip. So, this is uh, our setup, uh, setup in the laboratory. What I have done is uh, uh, I have connected initially the static uh, 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 control rectifier is connected to the field winding, but I also have a diode rectifier which right now is open. So, that is what uh, was shown to you. The input of the diode rectifier is of course, the terminals of the A, B, C terminals of the generator itself. What I will do is I will disconnect the existing control rectifier and uh, instead of that I will connect the output the DC terminals of the diode rectifier to the synchronous uh, synchronous machine field. Okay. So, that is what you are seeing here. So, the diode bridge is connected to the generator terminals on the AC side and the DC terminals are connected to the synchronous machine field winding. Okay. So, this is what I have done. Of course, if I do not rotate the machine there will be no voltage induced and nothing will happen actually by doing this, but what I will do now is slowly start rotating the machine. Okay. Remember that I am not separately exciting it, the output of the output voltage at the terminals of the DC machine itself uh, of the synchronous machine itself is being used to excite the machine. Okay. What I am doing now is starting the prime mover which is the DC machine. What you are seeing here is I have applied the field voltage to the DC machine. Now, I am applying the armature voltage to the DC uh, to the DC machine which is the prime mover to the AC machine. As soon as I start the start it this way you will find that the machine starts rotating. Uh, you will shortly see the machine rotating. What really we wish to show you is that after a certain speed the voltage kicks and the machine uh, the synchronous machine self excites. Okay. So, what you see is that there is some voltage at the terminals of the machine. Also, you see there is a field synchronous machine field current and a synchronous machine field voltage. Okay. So, the machine of course, is rotating at a low speed. In fact, uh, at a very low speed itself you find that there is enough voltage to trigger self excitation. Okay. So, just by connecting the output of a machine to a diode bridge rectifier and feeding it back to the synchronous machine field, we are able to in fact demonstrate that uh, self excitation can occur. Okay. So, uh, let me just uh, repeat what I said, uh, uh, just draw a schematic of what I showed you. So, what I had is a synchronous machine, its output was simply rectified using a diode rectifier and it was fed to the field winding and you saw that after a certain speed is acquired by a synchronous machine, of course, the synchronous machine is is uh, driven by a DC machine, you find that there is adequate voltage to trigger a kind of positive feedback or uh, you know the self excitation phenomena. Right now remember that uh, in order for this to work well, uh, the voltage here the residual flux in the machine should be enough to forward bias the diode diodes in this bridge at least at some speed. Okay. So, there at some speed the voltage magnitude here should be adequate to trigger self excitation. Okay. Otherwise, of course, uh, one will have to use the station batteries for what is known as field flashing initially and after that one can switch over to this configuration. Okay. So, what you have here is of course, uh, a static excitation system. A static excitation system requires a brushes and a slip ring uh, to uh, in fact, two slip rings and brushes to convey 
the field voltage to the field winding which is usually rotating in a, uh, a typical synchronous machine. Okay. So, if you look at uh, uh, some uh, interesting pictures which I have got here which is courtesy the Western Regional Power Committee Mumbai, you will find that this is a snapshot of a synchronous machine. Uh, what you see here uh, right at the end are in fact the slippering brush arrangement. Okay. You see this is actually uh, luckily it is exposed for us here. So, you can see that the brushes and the slip rings. Okay. So, this is a snapshot of that you get a close up also. So, you see those brushes rubbing against uh, the slip ring. Okay. So, this is the end region of a uh, end uh, it is on one side of the synchronous machine. In fact, if you look at this another snapshot what you see here is on one side is the place where the slip rings are on one side you have got the slip rings through which the field voltage is conveyed. In fact, the exciter itself is in another room okay, and uh, the voltage is uh, conveyed to these slip rings via the brushes. On one at one end you see these green structures here, the blue structure here is of course, the synchronous generator itself. The green structures here are in fact the turbine okay, which really control the mechanical power input to the synchronous machine. Another kind of uh, excitation system uh, is uh, what is known as the brushless excitation system. This slightly looks a bit more complicated than our uh, static excitation system in which the exciter itself is static, it does not move and the voltage which the exciter gives is conveyed via slip rings and brushless arrangement. Okay. Now, uh, a brushless excitation system on the other hand has got a slightly different structure. Uh, what you have essentially I will just try to uh, you know describe it here. A rotating permanent magnet, okay. a rotating permanent magnet is there in a permanent magnet generator. So, a rotating permanent magnet causes voltage to be induced in the stator, the stationary part of a permanent magnet generator. Okay. The voltage output of the permanent magnet generator itself is fed, this is a this is fed to a controlled rectifier. This is again a thyristor based rectification system. Okay this is a control rectifier in, in the sense that the, you, the DC voltage is a function of the AC voltage as well as the control signals which is essentially the firing angle delays which is obtained from a control system. We shall discuss this control system, it is also called a voltage regulation system. So, this is a control rectifier by which we can actually control the output which eventually goes through the main generator. Okay. But of course, there are unlike a static excitation system, there are several steps before this is actually done. What you have here is of course, the control rectifier which controls the output of this is now DC, the output of the control rectifier is DC. The permanent magnet stator, the control rectifier are both stationary, whereas the magnet of the permanent magnet generator of course, is rotating. Okay. The DC output of the control rectifier is fed to the to the field winding of an, of an AC generator. Now, this is not the main generator which we are talking of, this is a generator of the excitation system. Okay. Now, the field winding of this particular AC generator remember is stationary. Okay. So, on the rotor of a synchronous of this particular synchronous generator, okay, the rotor has got the armature windings. Okay. The stator has got the field windings. So, the three phase armature windings are in fact on the rotor of this machine. Okay. This is called an excitation system generator. Okay. Now, the output of this synchronous generator is three phase AC. Okay. So, I have got rotating armature windings. So, you are getting rotating windings which are in which three phase AC is induced, AC voltages are induced. 
Now, these three phase AC voltages are fed to a rotating, this is also rotating uncontrolled rectifier, which is nothing but a diode bridge, okay, a three phase diode bridge, which is also rotating. So, this R on top here indicates rotating structure. Okay. So, you have got rotating structure, a diode bridge which is rotating, the output of this diode is fed to the field winding which is also rotating. Okay. So, the final field voltage is conveyed to the field winding of the main generator, the generator which we are really interested in directly you do not have to have a slippering brush arrangement because the rotating the diode bridge also is rotating along with the field winding. So, it is a direct connection you do not really have to have a slippering brush arrangement. Okay. So, I will just repeat this again you have got a permanent magnet generator in which you get, get three phase voltages induced on the stator. The three phase voltage output of the permanent magnet generator itself is rectified using a controlled rectifier the output of the control rectifier is fed to the stationary field winding of a excitation alternator or excitation synchronous generator. The three phase voltages of this generator are excited on the rotor of the machine, they are on the rotor of the machine. The output of that is fed to a diode bridge which is rectified and fed to the main field and does not require slip rings. Okay. So, some large generators in fact have this kind of arrangement. Okay. Now, of course, I have been talking of uh, control rectifier and so on. What exactly is a control rectifier? It is in fact an arrangement of uh, thyristors typically, it is the kind of uh, rectifiers which are used in most excitation systems are using thyristors. Okay. So, controlled rectifiers are made out of thyristors. If you look at a thyristor, three phase thyristor bridge, it is made out of six thyristors the input of course, is uh, the three phase AC AC input and the output is DC okay. and uh, that is what I have been representing as this box here. So, this is equivalent to a box with three phase inputs and the DC input in this fashion, uh, DC output in this fashion. One important point which you should note at this point, I do not know whether it is visible on the screen. So, I will just re redraw it here. So, if you take a thyristor bridge which is schematically denoted as I showed you some time back. Remember that a thyristor bridge has if you denote the voltages and currents in this fashion, the V D C can be positive or negative, but I D C is always positive. Okay. So, that is one important thing which you should remember that this particular rectifier does not allow current to flow in the negative direction. Now, uh, we have a small video clip which shows you controlled rectifier operation. In fact, you can by manual, uh, you can manually in the, in the video clip we are showing, we are showing the voltages which are developed in a synchronous machine due to application of this excitation voltage. The excitation voltage itself is the output of a control rectifier and uh, the control rectifier is controlled by controlling the delay angle of the thyristor bridge. Okay. So, you can actually uh, by doing that you can control the DC component of the voltage which appears uh, across the thyristor bridge. Okay. Now, remember one uh, small point which you should uh, remember this thyristor bridge, if you use a six uh, what you call a thyristor bridge consisting of six thyristors as I had shown you some time back, you can look at it again. In that case, the DC voltage is V D C will have the sixth harmonic. Okay. It is a DC voltage with sixth harmonic okay. uh, and a DC component itself. So, you have got a DC sixth harmonic, twelfth harmonic and so on. Okay. No lower order harmonics are present other than of course, the DC component itself. So, you have got the DC component 6th, 12th and so on. So, this is known as often called a 6 pulse thyristor bridge. Okay. So, what we will do is now see a simple situation here, a simple video clip which will demonstrate to you how a thyristor, thyristor bridge voltage, the output DC voltage can be changed by controlling the delay angle. So, that will be done manually. Uh, in the 
a video clip which will be shown to you. We do not start the machine uh, for this purpose, we just switch on the excitation system and apply a DC voltage to the field winding. The aim of course is to show you 6 pulse operation, this is the static excitation box in which we have got a 6 pulse bridge. You will have to pay attention to the ammeter and voltmeter on your right. What we will do now is to reduce the firing angle from greater than 90 to less than 90 after a point an average DC voltage which is greater than 0 appears and a continuous current is established and what you see here is uh, the output of a 6 pulse bridge near about uh, 70 or 80 degrees. Now, we are increasing the DC voltage by decreasing the uh, delay angle and you see of course, that the ripple comes down and the average value seems to be going up. You can see the ammeter, voltmeter as well as the CRO on your left. Okay. Now, what we will do is we have of course, increase the voltage uh, and made firing angle near about 30 or 40 degrees. We will do now uh, by increasing the firing angle again, we can uh, decrease the DC voltage and now you see again the voltage coming down, the DC voltage and uh, the ripple of course, increases. You would have noticed of course, that the ripple is a, uh, of course, it is not very clear on the CRO, it is a sixth harmonic ripple. Now, uh, before I go ahead and uh, uh, you know, you know discuss something more about the excitation system itself, uh, I mentioned to you that there is a need to have some kind of continuous control over the excitation system, because the excitation voltage which is given to the synchronous machine. because uh, the synchronous machine has got a very poor regulation because of having a large value of x d. Okay. So, this is something which I discussed just some time back. So, what I will do now is show you a small uh, a second a third video clip of uh, uh, the drop uh, a very precipitous drop in voltage once you start loading a synchronous machine by a resistive load. So, what I will do is start the synchronous machine set the field voltage at a certain uh, field voltage, so that you get roughly uh, the rated voltage at the generator terminals. Then what I will do is load the synchronous machine by a resistive load, I simply a passive resistive load. As I try to decrease the resistance from, inf I mean if it is open of course, the resistance is infinity, but as I start loading it, that is I reduce the resistance from a certain value, I go on decreasing the resistance and a load the synchronous machine, you will find what happens is that the terminal voltage of a synchronous machine drops and uh, as, as a result of that, you will find that in fact, the synchronous machine is not able to take on uh, much power, because the voltage drops so much that it goes beyond the maximum power point of uh, you know uh, of this particular situation, of this particular source. Okay. So, as I go on decreasing the resistance, I have tried to load the machine, but unfortunately the terminal voltage goes on dropping. So, eventually the machine does not get loaded at all. So, this is what you will see in the next video clip. So, the machine has been started via the prime mover. Now, what I will do is adjust the field winding. Right now, there is no voltage which is there across the field. I will change the delay angle of this uh, thyristor bridge and gradually try to develop some voltage across the field and therefore, the terminal voltage will appear. Yeah, So, I have uh, kind of tried to change the delay angle, so that I get the rated voltage at the terminals of the synchronous machine. Now, what I will do is, I will load the machine by connecting a resistive load to it. So, this is being done gradually. So, you can keep an eye on the power 
मीटर yeah so now the the you can see that the load is slightly increasing as i introduce a resistance but what is very striking is the voltage initially which was at 230 volts decreases as i go on loading the machine in fact if i go on loading the machine the voltage in fact drops almost to half of what the rated value was so if i don't touch the field winding voltage what i'm showing you now is i'm readjusting the field voltage so as to i'm readjusting the field voltage so as to get back to the rated value yeah so unless i do that the voltage will drop to a very low value and we will not be able to load the machine adequately okay so what i'll just repeat what i did i loaded the machine and you saw that if i kept the field voltage constant you would find that the terminal voltage of the machine drops and in fact you're not able to take on the complete uh, power the actual power uh, which is delivered to the load is not we can't increase it beyond a point because of the large source impedance in the form of xd but if i increase efd that is the field voltage uh, i can get back the voltage back to the rated value so that is what you really need to do if you look at what needs to be done in a typical excitation system is to have some kind of continuous control we didn't have it in our uh, the demonstrations which i showed to you so far in fact you can see that the uh, there is no continuous control i had to manually adjust the field voltage of the excitation system this is not desirable because load could change suddenly and then you may have a sudden dip in the voltage so you always need to have uh, the excitation system in continuous control mode so what you need to do for example the most simplest thing would you would need to do is monitor the terminal voltage of a synchronous machine in case it drops you keep adjusting the field voltage so that the uh, you know the voltage is maintained so you adjust the field voltage in such a way now uh, this really brings us to a new dimension so to speak in our course we will be we have so far been talking about modeling of power apparatus we can of course talk in terms of now uh, how you really introduce control systems which themselves may be dynamical systems mind you so how do you have control continuous uh, feedback systems introduced into our models so that we can accurately describe their effect so for example right now one of the ways one of the things you uh, would probably do is measure the terminal voltage of a generator so you measure the terminal voltages of a generator so what you do is of course have a pt and feed it to a regulator the regulator in fact gives the appropriate signals to the controlled rectifier of your excitation system it could be a brushless excitation system or a static excitation system and that feeds voltage to the generator field okay so this excitation system could be a brushless excitation or a static excitation system okay but in both cases you do have a controlled rectifier the signals to the controlled rectifier to enhance the voltage or reduce it are in fact obtained from the voltage regulator now what is what is a voltage regulator the voltage regulator itself is some kind of control system it is a dynamical system but it is not a power apparatus it is basically consisting of some hardware which tries to implement certain mathematical functions remember that the control signal to a thyristor bridge is not what is known as a high power signal it is just a it is has enough strength to convey to a thyristor or uh, to the gate of the thyristors to delay their firing so the power levels which which are here uh, which are used by a control system are much much lower than the actual power rating of the apparatus it is trying to control okay so in that sense although we will be modeling 
these regulators etc they are also going to be differential equations and dynamical systems in most cases but they are not power apparatus they are in fact uh, low power apparatus they are essentially signals okay so for example you could give some set point okay uh, to rather set point is the value would like the terminal voltage of your synchronous generator to be is the value at which it should run okay you measure the actual voltage which is generated okay step it down and get it to measurable or signal levels a low power signal you can say you have a comparator this is some hardware it's it's some kind of built in hardware comparator or uh, that is using analog electronics you make a comparator or using uh, even digital uh, systems you can implement this using some software okay so we'll of course discuss these things a bit later in the next maybe in the next class so by comparing this you will know the error and then by some control law the control law could be just a simple gain or an amplifier you could determine the control signal which is to be given to the control rectifier which is a power apparatus okay so the this is the power apparatus so the output of this is a control system uh, is a signal which is given to this power apparatus now this power apparatus interprets this signal appropriately and appropriately changes the output of the voltage of this rectifier okay now there is some mapping of course between the value which is obtained here okay and how much change it causes here so i one way of doing that is if i if the output of this changes by delta alpha how much is the voltage change here okay so that is something you should know beforehand before you design this control system okay so what this is one way of controlling the voltage if there is a larger the error the larger is this correction which you make here okay so of course of course if the voltage is low if v is less than v ref this error will be present and you should of course control uh, design your control system so that it drives the power apparatus to rectify this situation correct this situation so it changes the signal given to the control rectifier so that the voltage increases okay so this is what it will do under the circumstance where voltages are low okay so it's a continuously acting of course this is very important it's a continuously acting control system okay so this is one thing which you should uh, remember you need to do this uh, in addition to just having the power apparatus okay you have a continuously controlled uh, control system okay now uh, remember that uh, once one of the things which i hinted to you i talked to you about is you need to know how much you need to change the output of a control system okay and map it to what the power apparatus of what the power the excitation system the way it behaves okay so for example in a brushless excitation system which i had shown you some time back you should have in your hand a mapping of how this control signal change in this control signal changes the dc output of this how the change in dc output of this changes the ac voltage output of the synchronous generator and correspondingly how this change reflects here in the final change in the field field voltage and of course once you change the field voltage we know how it affects this main generator by just the synchronous machine equations which we have been discussing uh, all this while okay in the previous lectures so you know how a synchronous machine behaves but you need to model all these components here that is the rectifier itself then the ac generator it is also a generator so you may wish to model this in detail i mean the amount of detail is something which is based on our engineering judgment you also need to model the behavior of a diode bridge rectifier okay so you need to model not only you know these are not just algebraic relationships between the input and output you may actually have to model some of these components at least 
as dynamical systems as differential equations. Okay. So, what you have is this power apparatus which is the synchronous machine itself. Now, you have got another power apparatus which is the excitation system which you need to model uh, in some detail. Now, the amount of detail depends on the kind of studies you are doing. Okay. So, as I mentioned some time back in a brushless excitation system you have a generator the excitation system itself has a small generator there. Okay. It is not as large of course, as the main generator that itself may have to be modeled in some detail. Okay. Uh, but there of course, on the other hand there are some studies which really do not require you to model these things in great amount of detail. You will get more or less the same results even if you use a simplified model. Okay. So, these and some other issues will be discussed in our next lecture.